Well, hello. Welcome to the desert. I'm Bob. I'm out here shouting into the wilderness right now, into the air, trying to be heard by someone. I think there'll be someone that will listen. But that's what we have to do when things are not being said in the church that need to be said. And this particular topic, the coming again of Jesus Christ, is so radical these days. There's so many people fighting about this and that theory and I just I just want to shout when I'm in the church, but that doesn't work too well. So let me come out here and talk to you a while. We're going to talk about the basics today of this coming again of Jesus, especially in the light of the word rapture you hear about a lot these days. It's never been mentioned in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. The word isn't. But we know the idea is there. So let's define what we're going to be talking about. Let's talk about rapture. What does it mean? In my opinion, the term itself rapture not found in the Bible is part of the problem that we're having to confront. You see, by giving a new label to this portion of the second coming of Jesus, the teachers who promote this message cause their hearers to understand it in a separated way. Well, there's rapture, and then there's the second coming. You see, there's the problem right there. The Bible doesn't do that. There's no division in the Bible. Different name, different event, they say. No, it's not there. Can you believe that? It's just not there. The word itself means the state of being caught away in body or spirit. And the idea roughly responds to the Greek harpazo, which is used several times in the scripture, translated several ways, but always with the idea of taking something away. Consider the following passages that are in quotes from Harpazo, the words in quotes, and, and I will tell you which ones. Matthew 13, 19 speaks of how the enemy, quote, snatches what of God's word is sown in the heart of man. That, that word is used there, the snatching away. John 10, 12, in a similar vein, speaks of the wolf who catches sheep and then scatters them. Acts 8, 39. The Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip. 2 Corinthians 12, 2 to 4, speaks of Paul's catching up into paradise. Here's a preview of our own rapture. Yes, that's where they get that idea, though the word rapture in English is not there. <clears throat> in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, harpazo is used to speak of the subject at hand, the catching up of all believers to be with the Lord. In Revelation 12, 5, the elect child is caught up to God. So the idea of, of a catching up all the way from Enoch in the Bible to Elijah, to Jesus, to our own future appointment with Christ, it's a legitimate one. And the term rapture seen in this light is surely a descriptive and helpful word. But it's unfortunate that the catching away of Christ's bride has been disassociated from the destination of the believers. We will be caught up of this. There's, there's no doubt, no contention, no fighting, I hope, among us. But when? And then what? Uh, are we left suspended in, in midair? No. What happens before and after our rapture? That's in the book. But we don't want to talk about that because people just love to fight so much. How about the word tribulation? We better define that one before we go on. Um, most students of prophecy who believe in the time of trouble, uh, they, they do believe in this. It's, it's well documented by the prophets. A time of trouble, a special time of trouble coming to the earth. Jesus and John both believed in that, taught it. For example, the prophet Jeremiah in his 30th chapter sees a future era that he calls Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah 37. The reference is to the father of the Jewish nation, Jacob, also known as Israel. He says that this time is going to be an unprecedented time of devastation. The same thing that an angel who appears in the book of the prophet Daniel says about a quote, time of trouble coming to the planet. In association with 
resurrections and judgments. In other words, this tribulation period is at the end of all things. It's at the end. That same line of thought is repeated by Jesus in Matthew 24. Here the word is tribulation, but that's simply another translation of the same Greek word translated trouble in other passages. Jesus, too, is speaking of the end of all things, which his disciples had asked him about. He says it immediately follows this tribulation, the end of all things. First comes that tribulation and then the end of all things. And John's book of Revelation describes the horrors of God's wrath, leaving no doubt to the reader that the time that he describes is also the time of the end. So we've got to deal with the the prefix is pre and post. There's some major trouble coming. We know that. Unprecedented, that is. Trouble like we've never seen on the earth. Think of the worst things that have ever happened on earth. It's going to be worse than that. Much worse. And it'll be final. And there's a snatching up, a catching away, a rapture. That's all coming too. We know that. The Bible is clear on all these. The whole issue that we deal with here is which comes first, the trouble or the flight? If one believes that the catching up is first, he's called a pre-tribulation rapturist. Now you know what those words mean. Whether he particularly likes the label or not, that's what he is. If he believes the rapture, the catching up to be with Jesus, is after that tribulation, and in fact a part of the second coming of Jesus, as I do, He's known as a post-tribulation rapturist, whether he likes that definition or not, or that label. I hate labels, but that's what they're called. So how did the church ever get so divided on this issue that seems so clear in Scripture? Let's trace the teaching then back to Bible days. And I'm going to do a little history here this time. What have God's people historically believed about the catching away down through the many ages of the church? What have they believed? Has it always been like today with these two major opposing views drawing people into one group or another? No, absolutely no. Now a warning before we proceed. After the Bible, which is apostolic and inspired, there's no perfect book. There's no perfect teacher. In the years that followed the death of the apostles, many men began to write. Some building as closely as they could on the revelation that was already in existence from the apostles and the prophets. Others began to veer off from time to time. This veering off has left us with a, a great variety of teachings published in the name of the Lord making it easy for the promulgator of any new doctrine down to this day to establish his cause somewhere in the chaos. All you have to do is appeal to the church fathers, as they're called, these writers right after the apostles. Uh, well, to them, it's a final say-so to an otherwise shaky point. They appeal to the fathers, but the fathers disagreed. Now, there were good men and good books. But as I say, many of the teachings found in those days are not grounded in God's word, and they disagree with each other. In spite of individual problems and individual teachers, and it seems even the best of men missed it, and still do sometimes, there were streams of thought that continued down to us in spite of all that, both in our scriptures and in the collected works of the great writers. The deity of Christ is intact. The second coming, intact. Salvation by grace through faith. It all was picked up and passed on. Thank God for that. God had faithful witnesses who were able to see and communicate necessary truths to the next generations. Having said that, we ask, what about the theory of a pre-tribulation rapture historically? Well, in fact, it falls far short of verification. 
It's only found twice from the fourth century all the way to the 18th century and not in any substantial body of literature until the 19th century. Sadly, this viewpoint is a newcomer to the world of theology. It's actually in the minority view to this day if you look at the church worldwide. The Western church seems to have grabbed onto it. Is it because we like our comfort so much we can't believe that we would ever have to go through trouble? Mm. Now, the teachers of this doctrine believe that they have scriptural grounds for their beliefs. Well, surely we will examine scripture in detail later. But for now, let's trace the doctrine through history. And I must say, it will be a short journey because there's not much there, as I said. Let's look at the man Ephraim. Ephraim, going to Persia of the, of the Roman Empire days. Persia. It's the fourth century. The teacher that we're going to examine is a dedicated deacon. His name is Ephraim. Seemed to be a very holy man. He's said to have been a, a hermit. For the last 10 years of his life, I can, I can understand why people want to escape like that. Indeed, the record shows he was greatly revered by Syrian, Orthodox, and Nestorian believers. Nestorians were heretics, understand. And some of the major denominations of his day, they, they, they went after Ephraim. His writings, evidently quite numerous, were read just after the scriptures in some churches. One of those writings contains a passage that may indeed be a preview of what will come many hundreds of years later in its fullness. But do remember, 300 years have passed since the apostles wrote. This is the first hint of a pre-tribulation rapture. Ephraim believed the end of the world was near, and people have believed that all through history. Because things happen, and it looks like something that Jesus was talking about. So they say, he's coming, he's coming soon. And we're doing it still today with the whole Gog and Magog thing. And I'm speaking now during the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And people are talking, ah, Gog and Magog, this is it. We're, this is it. This is the end of history. Maybe, but not necessarily. I don't believe Russia will be the final world ruler. We'll talk about that another time. He believed that the Holy Spirit confirmed this to him. I'd love to go off right now onto the charismatic thing where every time they get a feeling about something, that's the Holy Spirit talking to them. And they'll, they want to talk to you right after that and tell you that God has spoken. But most of the time he hasn't, not through them. So beware of those today whose confirmed words are contrary to the apostolic words, the, the New Testament, the Bible. In his thinking, in Ephraim's thinking, there was only one sign which remained to be, un, to be done, and that was the advent of the wicked one, the coming of the Antichrist, and the completion of the Roman kingdom. That's what he said. That sounds like a post-tribulation view, really. But several sentences later, he adds this, quote, for all the saints and elect of God are gathered prior to the tribulation that is to come and are taken to the Lord, lest they see the confusion that is to overwhelm the world because of our sins. Hmm. Ephraim is appealing to logic, his own logic, his own understanding of theology, not to some revelation somewhere. No authority is given for his conclusion, though his statement makes a lot of sense to some. But this type of reasoning, any kind of human reasoning, is the, the fuel of false doctrine and of this pre-tribulation thinking. There's much sense to it, but no solid scriptural backing. I will show you that later also. How about Morgan Edwards? Morgan Edwards. Got to travel 1,400 years from Ephraim before we find another word about a pre-tribulation rapture. 1,400 years. And the source that we find here is not altogether convincing. The story goes 
that Mr. Edwards, Morgan Edwards, was in his 20s at the writing of a certain paper for a college professor. The teacher was asking Mr. Edwards to defend the literal interpretation of scripture, which he didn't believe in, but he wanted this, this student to try to defend it. Now, that was a process that was not in vogue in that day, the literal interpretation of scripture, not at that college anyway. To do so, Morgan invented a new doctrine, which it seems he did not espouse for himself, but rather he theorized it as an intellectual pursuit. He even uses Acts 17, 19, and 20 on his title page, a passage you may recall. Could I read it to you? May we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak. For you are bringing some strange thing to our ears. That's from Acts 17. You remember the men of Athens talking to Paul about new things. Morgan actually quoted the words of pagan philosophers in his opening salvo to the, to the book. And Mr. Edwards certainly would have delighted the men of Mars Hill, for not only does he come up with a pre-tribulation rapture, he also speculates that the lake of fire is in the moon and that all planets in the solar system are inhabited. Um, some historians who are looking for the modern beginnings of pre-tribulation teaching discount Mr. Edwards altogether. So not doing too well here uh, historically, are we, for pre-trib rapture? Margaret MacDonald is next. So far, we have a fourth century hermit and a Bible college student on assignment espousing the pre-trib view in all those hundreds and hundreds of years. Not exactly a part of the stream of revelation that I was discussing earlier. Why would the church be bereft of a doctrine so important for all this time? I suggest that 1830 is a more substantial date for the beginning of this doctrine, at least in modern times, if you want to call 19th century modern, and compared to the others it is. It was during this year, 1830, that 15-year-old Margaret MacDonald, who was a prophetess of the newly arising Pentecostal movement in Scotland, she described a vision that she had seen that stated that Christians were to be raptured just prior to the Great Tribulation. Well, this event, which has been documented by many, her prophecy and so on, and she denied a lot of her stuff later on, but it causes a whole lot of folks, especially the Pentecostals of our own day, to give pause. Surely, if something was spoken by a word from the Lord, we can't take it lightly, they reason. And yet these same people would have to take the words of Jesus and Paul very lightly to believe Margaret. One sadly lacking gift in the explosion of the charisma, the gifts supposedly over these years, has been the gift of discernment whereby utterances can and must, biblically, be challenged and compared to what God has already said. And when it's discerned that deception is at hand, a further discernment is needed, namely the identification of the spirit that's coming into the meeting and the subsequent repudiation of it, along with the teaching that it promotes. Have you ever seen that done? Not too often. It seems Margaret was not challenged at the time of her utterance, and she's not now by that group. Edward Irving, within a year or two after Margaret's revelation, Presbyterian pastor or Edward Irving of the Irvingite fame in London, the Catholic Apostolic Church, where he was being led also by others into the Pentecostal things, 
he heard about Margaret's dream, developed it theologically, and began teaching it to his congregation. Have you ever noticed that phenomenon? You've probably done it yourself. I've done it. Where you get a hold of an idea first, you're sure it's, it's right, and then you go into the scripture and try to make the scriptures say what you already believe. That's not exegesis, that's eisegesis. Into, you're bringing your own thoughts into the text. It's a very bad way to find out what God is saying. We try to get the word out of the text, not put our own into it. About this time, the man that was called the father of modern dispensationalism also got wind of McDonald's dream. This is John Darby. He paid her a visit, also made some changes theologically, and incorporated the whole idea into his theories. He wasn't Pentecostal, but he took things where he could find them. He was also the father of the Plymouth Brethren Movement, a church which was openly proud of what they called this new doctrine. Brian Shortley, in a book called Is the Pre-Tribulation Rapture Biblical, says the Plymouth Brethren openly admitted and were even proud of the fact that among their teachings were totally new ones which had never been taught by the church fathers or by the medieval scholars or by Protestant reformers or the many commentaries. It's not clear to me about whom uh, the prince of preachers Charles Spurgeon was speaking in the following quote, but one wonders if it wasn't these brethren themselves. Spurgeon lived in the day when the pre-tribulation rapture was freshly hatched. It's obvious what he thought of the idea, and I don't quote him as a biblical source. I'm just telling you what Charles Spurgeon said one time. There's a certain troublesome sect abroad nowadays to whom the one thing needful is a perpetual speculation upon prophecy. They plume themselves upon an expected secret rapture, and I know not what vain imaginings beside. And then we can't leave out C.I. Schofield. I don't know if you've studied his life, but it didn't turn out too well, um, ethically, we'll put it that way. He was the creator of the Schofield Reference Bible. That was 1917. And Mr. Schofield included Darby's teachings in his note. You see how it just all travels down? McDonald, Irving, Darby, Schofield. And we've got a train of thought that has continued to this day. Seeing such things in the Bible, quote unquote, emboldened many other saints to trust this doctrine as though God had said it himself. It wasn't in the text, but it was right there by the text. There followed the inclusion of pre-tribulationism in the curriculums of well-known and greatly loved institutions, even Moody Bible Institute, Dallas Theological Seminary. And in the 1970s, a book and a movie by young people's theologian, Hal Lindsey, well, there seemed to be no stopping it after that. Today, it's permeated much of the Western evangelical world. It's far from universal in the church today, and far from historical, I've shown you. But there is, as we say, a very vocal minority of believers, mostly Western, mostly American, who swear by this doctrine, and they'll get upset with you if you try to tell them something else. That's why I'm out here in the desert. Nobody gets upset with me out here. I might get a note or two, but I can deal with that. Well, I would like you to stay in touch with me, stay in fellowship. And to that end, I'm going to uh, give you a list of ways you can do that, if I can ever find it. And I usually can. Here it is. Excuse me. Here is a list of things that I'm into and have done and am doing. My sermon audio site here, 3,000 audios. You have to find something there that'll be a blessing to you. Much of it is based 
or, or featuring North Korean persecution through the years. I think we have 400 audios in English and 400 in Korean to address that problem. Um, I have this site that you probably are on right now, YouTube, Pastor Lands. We have other preachers here on this site too. I'm on Facebook. I do street evangelism. You can contact me about that. If you're local, we can go out to the street together. You can come to our Zoom men's meeting every Saturday, 7 o'clock. Uh, all the times I give our central standard time in the United States. Brinford Bible Church is a place you might want to visit with me sometime, or the Cornerstone Evangelical Free Church up where I live. Or you might just say hello, contact me with the uh, email there, and I can give you any details that you need beyond that. Text me at the number that's there. Thank you so much for being here. I do hope we can share again together. And uh, it's fun. I, I don't know who will listen, but I know I said it and I feel so much better. Truth means everything to us. If we don't have truth, what do we have? Amen. God bless. Talk again soon. Bye-bye.